All right, Mr. Rickers, you may proceed. the things that you heard into context because everything in life needs context I want to take you back to April 26th of 2017 Skylar goes to her first OBGYN appointment in her entire life she had never been there and she went to get birth control <coughs> pills and she had a choice she could go wherever she wanted she chose to go to the doctor that delivered her Dr. Andrew whom you'll hear from he delivered Skyler. He delivered her brother. And I think you'll find his testimony very interesting and important in this case. Now, when Skyler went to Dr. Andrew on April 26th of 2017, she was full term. She was 37 to 39 weeks pregnant earlier. But she did not know certainly that she, she was pregnant. How do we know that? She reacted like any 18-year-old girl who's told for the first time that she is certainly pregnant would. And if she had this sinister motive to hide and conceal the fact that she was going to kill a child, she wouldn't have reacted like that. It can't, can't be both ways. She reacted genuinely when she first found out that she was pregnant. And you will hear from Dr. Andrew probably today. And Dr. Andrew will tell you that the things that the prosecutor mentioned about suicide, he tells every woman in their third trimester and that her response, he's been a doctor for decades. He's delivered thousands of babies. And he said that her response for a young teenage mother was normal for finding out the first time that you're pregnant. Not unexpected, especially given she was 37. Well, I'll get into that in a minute. At the time, no one knew she, how pregnant she was, including the doctor. Now, Skylar did have, as I mentioned, a suspicion that she was pregnant prior to April 26th of 2017. And the two things that typically tell most women that they're certainly pregnant were not uncommon for Skylar, and that was weight gain and a lack of a menstrual cycle. Skylar suffered from the age of 12 from a very serious eating disorder. She went to Children's Hospital uh, to see a nutritionist when she was very young in junior high. She saw a psychologist named Terry Roll uh, for about two years of her life. She was in and out of treatment because her mom and dad were so worried about her eating disorder. Which also, these text messages that the prosecutor takes grossly out of context about her body and her, her image of her body, she was like that for years, since really eighth grade. And her mother was very obsessive. And her mother now, I think, realizes that the way in which she talked to Skylar, cheering her on about losing weight, was like throwing gasoline on a fire, an eating disorder didn't deal with it well. And so those texts that we now see after May 7th, looking back on hindsight, were Skylar focusing on the only thing she thought she could control at the time, which is her body. And she did. She put a smile on for the outside world. And you'll hear from Dr. Andrew and probably Dr. Boyce, who the prosecutor is going to call. And they're going to talk to us about how people deal with, with stillbirths differently in their experience as doctors, as OBGYNs. These texts of Skylar's selfie text to her mother, text constantly about her weight, were common in Skylar's life for six years. Six years. Now, when Skylar went to this OBGYN appointment on April 26th, Dr. Andrew took two measurements of her stomach. And one, he used this tape. And this is a measuring tape from Hilltop OBGYN. It's called a fundal height measurement that he took using a measuring tape. This is his standard practice. And you'll see it in the records. He also took another measurement, which was a transabdominal ultrasound. And both measurements, independent of the other, gave him the estimation that Schuyler was only 32 weeks pregnant. Now, the fundal height measurement with the tape is much more accurate than the transabdominal ultrasound. And you'll hear that from Dr. Andrew. A fear for any obstetrician, any OBGYN, is if a woman is smaller, if the estimation is more than two weeks off on the small side. It's a very big indicator of a problem. 
It's called growth restriction, interuterine growth restriction, to be exact. In this case, Skylar was five to seven weeks too small. And we can tell by looking at her. I'm going to show you a picture of Skylar in a prom dress in February of 2017. This is when she picks out her dress with her mother in February of 2017. Same dress, corset back, no elasticity. And you'll have these pictures. Three months later, she gets through her third trimester. Three months later, on May 5th, when she goes to prom, her senior year, the same dress, no alterations are made. This is a side-by-side. -side. The picture I first showed you was on the left in February, and the picture in May, and you'll have it in your hands to look back in the jury room, May 5th. Now, there are people that you're going to hear from in this case who saw Skylar every single day. No motivation to lie. English teacher, his name's Mr. Curry, saw her every school day. He saw her May 5th two days before she delivers full term. He will tell us he had no idea she was pregnant. Her swim coach, her senior year, her boyfriend, who the prosecutors mentioned, they were in a sexual relationship. And you, you can tell from text messages, he had no idea she was pregnant. She was small. That goes to the growth-restricted fetus. And the weight fluctuations that I previously mentioned were up and down her whole life, 90 to 140 pounds. This is a side by side of Skylar, her sophomore winter and sophomore summer. Summer is on the left, and the winter is on the right. Six months apart. Her weight would fluctuate 30 to 40 pounds her entire life. She would miss a year of a period at times. This is Skylar six months apart, sophomore year in high school. And this is Skylar. It's something called the pigskin preview that they do in Carlisle, her senior year. This would be in about July or August of her senior year. Her weight went up and down constantly, and the people around her did not know that she was pregnant. Now, when Dr. Andrew takes this measurement with his measuring tape. He tells Skylar, and you're going to hear him say it. He's going to be in here, I think, today. And he's going to say, I told Skylar you can expect to deliver a baby within 10 weeks. That's what he'll tell us all. He said to Skylar, you can expect to deliver a baby within 10 weeks. 10 weeks is July 5th. So Skylar does think she has time. And you are going to see that her mother does not and would not probably have reacted to her pregnancy well. But she thinks she has time before she has to tell her mother and her boyfriend that she's pregnant. The doctor says within 10 weeks. Well, Skylar thinks she has 8 to 10 weeks. Now, what she does not know at the time and what nobody knows is that just 11 days later, not 10 weeks, 10 weeks, 11 days later, that she delivered. And she delivered a full-term baby. And that doesn't mean the baby was big. You can measure full-term by a, a femur length. It doesn't mean the baby had like good circumferences, and we'll hear a lot more about that from the doctors in this case, all the doctors. So Skylar goes to prom on May 5th with her boyfriend, Brandon, and she's having cramps. And Skylar thinks, I've heard pregnancy is difficult and painful, and she's naive, and she does not know that that might be pre-labor. She has no idea. The doctor told her within 10 weeks. And this is about eight days later, a week later. The next day, they go to the Reds game. She goes to the Reds game with her mom and dad and with her boyfriend. They come home. Her, boyfriend, her mom and dad go to bed. Her boyfriend, Brandon, sits down. They, they hang out on the couch downstairs in the living room right outside the, their mom and dad's door. He has a curfew around 10.30. Skylar and her boyfriend hang out. She's in pretty intense pain. 
She goes upstairs and she cannot sleep. And sometime around two or three in the morning, she has what she thinks is the most intense pain she's ever felt. She walks to the top of the stairs. She's gonna go downstairs to get some Aleve to help with the pain. And she can't keep her legs under her. She walks seven steps into her, the bathroom and sits down with the urge to urinate and delivers a baby. But the baby is white. The umbilical cord is not attached. The baby's not breathing, not moving, no sounds. Skylar grabs a towel. Skylar worked at a child watch center with children and babies. She grabs a towel off the towel rack and swaddles her child. She sits down on the bathroom floor, half naked and bleeding, with her back leaning up against her bathtub. You'll see pictures of her bathroom. The toilet would be right in front of her, the bathtub right behind her. So if this is the bathtub, she sits down, <coughs> butt on the ground, holding her baby. Touches her baby, she cries. Annabelle. <laughs> Skylar cries, not Annabelle. She names her daughter Annabelle. She names her daughter Annabelle. She stands up, she walks downstairs, she gets a tiny little spade shovel that you would dig up tulip bulbs with that her mom had in the garage. She walks outside, she walks out to a tree line that is visible from her bedroom window with all the strength she has left and digs a shallow grave. She places Annabelle inside, covers the grave with dirt and drags a flower pot that weighs about 25 pounds over in front of the gravesite. Gets flowers, puts them on the grave and goes back, down, goes back inside upstairs and collapses in bed. From her window, she can see this gravesite. So the prosecutor, and, and she did bury Annabelle in a shallow grave. So the prosecutor's discussion about conceal and destroy, she buried her daughter and marked the grave and put flowers on top of it. She didn't throw her in a trash can. She didn't throw her in a dumpster. So why are we here? Well, as I think you know, this case comes down ultimately to the interrogations. And the fairest thing to do for all of us would be to play them in their entirety right now. So we don't all have to sit here and wonder whether or not the words put police, whether or not the police put words in Skylar's mouth, whether or not the statements Skylar made were true or possible, so that you can all use your common sense and view it with your mind. I only have 45 minutes, and the interrogations actually lasted about nine hours, but the clips are down to about five and a half. I can't play them all for you right now. The fairest thing to do for the prosecutor would be play them early in the case, so we don't wonder if these statements were Skylar's words or the police words. But what I'd like to do right now is show some clips from those interrogations, if you mind. Um, July 14th was the first interrogation in this case. And a detective in the case, Detective Fain, summarized what was stated in that interrogation in a clip that I'm gonna play for you. And he says, we talked how on May 7th, you were really certain it was May 7th is the day, right? That you delivered her and it was in the bathroom sometime, maybe sometime in the middle of the night because your parents were home and asleep. You delivered her in the bathroom. She wasn't breathing or anything. Her eyes didn't open. There was no heartbeat and you checked, you pushed. You didn't want to push too hard because she was a brand new baby but you pushed just to check and there was no heartbeat. You held her for a little bit there like on your lap. And then you wrapped her in a towel and you went downstairs with her into the garage. Maybe it's called like, I'm just gonna call it like your mom's garden shovel or something like that. And took her and put her in a shallow grave right out in the backyard. And you didn't put the towel in there, you just put her in there and covered her up. Okay, is that, does that sound right, like, like what we talked about on Friday? He summarizes the interrogation of Friday in this clip. I'd like you to play clip 50. Okay, um, but, you know, we talked about how 
May 7th, and you were really certain May 7th is the day, right, that you delivered her. And it was in the bathroom sometime maybe sometime in the middle of the night because your parents were home and asleep. Um, you delivered her in the bathroom. Um, she wasn't breathing or anything. Her eyes didn't open. There was no heartbeat and you checked. You pushed. You didn't want to push too hard because she was a brand new baby, but you pushed just to check and there was no heartbeat. Um, you held her for a little bit there, like on your lap. And then you wrapped her in a towel and you went downstairs with her into the garage, got maybe it's called like your, I'm just going to call it like your mom's garden shovel or something like that, and took her out and put her in that shallow grave right out in the backyard. And you didn't put the towel in there. You just put her in there and covered her up. Okay. Is that, um, does that sound right? Like what we talked about Friday? Okay. Um, so the Friday he's referring to is the first interrogation on July 14th. And the Warren County Sheriff's Office does a press release after that interrogation. And they say, although the remains have not yet been identified, initial reports have led investigators to believe they are that of a stillborn baby. There are no charges filed, no arrests made. Well, what happens? Well, then comes this mistake by the prosecutor's doctor. Her name is Dr. Murray, and you're not going to hear from her. They're not going to call her to the stand. Dr. Murray rushes. She admits that she rushes. She says the bones are burned. The bones are charred. So the detectives have a job to do, and they're dead set on doing it. It changes everything about the case. Burning a bone of a baby. This doctor, many weeks later, said I was wrong. She told the prosecutor's office I was wrong. She said, I ain't going to lie to them, and I ain't going to lie for them. She thinks, she said, I don't know why I upset their apple cart so much when she admitted her mistake many weeks later, many weeks. But what happens? The police don't know that this doctor was wrong. They don't know that every doctor in this case will also come in here and say no evidence of burning. So they are dead set on getting a, not only a confession about burning, but now they're, said, they're dead set on getting a confession about a live baby. Go get a confession about burning, go get a confession about a live baby. So they schedule a second interrogation of Skyler. Six days later, now at this point, the police have been to the house, they've dug up Annabelle's remains, left some of her remains actually in the grave after they went through it the first time. And her mom and dad and her entire family, they trust the police. They trusted the police. Skylar was taught to trust authority. The police knew best. And she goes back, taken by her mom and dad, no lawyer, nothing, into a six by eight windowless room. And the police have to start making her vulnerable to their truth. They won't take Skylar's truth. And so I want to play a couple clips for <coughs> Before I do that, Skylar describes, and you'll see all this, she describes a dead baby 29 times. And some of the things she's saying, she doesn't know the medical significance of. I don't even think the police do. Not breathing, white, umbilical cord not attached, no need to cut the umbilical cord. And it's glossed over. She denies fire. She's utterly confused by fire comment. And the police won't take the truth from her. They want her to tell them their story. So how do they do it? Well, they make her vulnerable. They make her more susceptible to accepting their words. They tell Skylar that Annabelle's remains will not be returned to her family unless she tells them more of their truth. Please play a clip. I'm going to read it first. It's 110, just so you're right. Detective Fain, you're so close. We're still just waiting to hear. I guess all I can think about right now is Annabelle. You know, like I think about her remains just still being sifted through and sifted through by doctors and doctors. And I think about how your dad, how he already contacted me asking, could he have her remains so you guys can do a burial? And I feel awful, but none of that can happen because the investigation just keeps going and going. And we don't have the truth yet. But it's one thing. So just, you're, you're so close, we're so just waiting to hear this. I guess all I'm waiting to think about right now is Annabelle. 
And they don't stop there, and you're going to see all this with your own eyes and ears. But I'm going to play another clip. They tell Skyler that the doctors not only are searching, they're sifting and they're poking Annabelle. He says she deserves better, and Skyler's already said she deserved better, meaning Skyler said she deserved better, she needed a proper burial. He says she deserved better, better than being in a lab with doctors, you know, just searching and sifting and poking and everything. One, one fifteen, please. Better like she, like she deserves better, better than being in a lab with doctors, you know, just searching and sifting and poking and everything. Now the police at this time, when they're interrogating Skylar alone in this windowless room, they know that Skylar and her family have already contacted them and made the request to get Annabelle back. That Annabelle was taken out of their backyard in plastic buckets and that she and her family wanted to do a formal memorial and burial. They know this at the time. So they tell Skylar, and this is Detective Carter now, so we just need to know what happened. Again, so we can put her to rest. We can give her that final, we know everything that happened. We know you know in what order it happened, and we can just put her at rest, give her a proper memorial. You guys can do all of this with her remains. Skylar, I didn't do it. Detective Carter, well, I would assume your family is going to want to plan something when they get her back, but we can't release her until we know everything. 105. Again, so that we can put her at rest, we can give her that final, we know everything that happened, we know, you know, in what order it happened, and we can just put her at rest, you know, give her a proper memorial, you guys can do all of this sort of thing. I get to. Well, I would assume your family is going to want to plan something when they get her back, but we can't release her till we know everything, so we have to kind of... They tell Skylar that every time she gives them the truth, which is their truth, that they, and they've rep repeatedly denied hers. They tell her that, that every time she gives them the truth, their truth, that she's getting closer to getting Annabelle back, to giving her a proper eternal resting place. In 114, we don't have to play it right now, Detective Fain says, see, everything you do, every time you tell us the truth, it continues to help her. Because like Brandy said, that's Detective Carter, it fills in the hole and just keeps making it smaller. And then we're going to get it all the way closed and we're going to get her, you know, back to your family where she belongs. So, so there can be a real, you know, true burial where she's honored. 114, please. But help, it helps Annabelle. See, everything you do, every time you tell us the truth, it continues to help her. Because like Brandy said, it, it fills in this hole and just keeps making it smaller. And then we're going to get it all the way closed and we're going to get her, you know, back to your family where she belongs. So, so there can be a, a real, you know, true burial where she's honored. And they act like they're there to help Skylar. And Skylar, frankly, thinks that they are. You can see Skylar holding... Detective Carter's hands, one hand at first, two hands at times, I mean, holding each other's hands. She's holding the detective. And they say that it would, I'm going to show one thing. This is about the fire nonsense that apparently is not going to be admitted that's wrong. They say that it's a medical scientific certainty that there was burning. This is before they knew that this doctor was going to say I was wrong. And they tell Skylar that they believe her, that she would never hurt her child, but they're not their own bosses. That it would be a lot better if Skylar said she cremated her child, because some people might think she just threw her child in the middle of a fire. And they use that word cremate multiple times. So Detective Carter says, we know medically what happened, but there's a big difference I think you would agree between someone throwing someone in a fire and someone having a reason and some sort of justification for why that happened. Does that make sense? Okay. 112, please. We know medically. 
exactly what happened. But there's a big difference, I think you would agree, between someone throwing someone in a fire and someone having a reason and some sort of justification for why that happened. Does that make sense? Okay, that, that's what, I know you keep... Now, the word cremate is used repeatedly by the police. And they tell Skyler, essentially, I think you'll see this yourself, it's better to just agree with us, give us our truth, because you're not going to be accepted. Your truth won't be accepted. So guess what your words they get Skyler to say when they finally break her down, when they repeatedly refuse her denials? I touched the baby with a lighter and tried to cremate her a little bit. Now, what is not possible is a child catching on fire by touching it with a lighter. It is not possible. Babies are 80% water. And there is a conversation in the interrogations, and it is in the police report, that the flames went up to the chest before Skyler thought it was wrong and put them out. She's utterly confused by this whole conversation, but she's giving the police what they asked her to give them. She just went, shoo, she said. And the police don't second guess it at all, that it's impossible to ch touch a child with a lighter and have the child catch on fire. But that's the conversation that they have in this interrogation. How'd you put out the fire after you touch a baby with a lighter? Skyler's confused, and you'll hear it. Now, at the time, the police don't know that all this evidence, that this doctor will change her mind, that this evidence that they were told doesn't actually exist. And they tell Skylar after she's, in fact, I'll show you a report from the state's own doctor. This is their doctor, Dr. Latham. She writes a letter to the prosecutors, Mr. Knippen. This is her report. She's an anthropologist out of Indiana. Thank you. And she says, You'll hear from her, Dr. Latham. It's the state's doctor. She says there are no signs of burning. Their own doctor. But it's too late. This letter's dated January 2018. Now, when they have her vulnerable, when they've made her malleable, when they've used all this stuff against her, her sadness about her daughter and the remains, then they say, you gotta tell us signs of life. We don't think you killed her if you tell us there were signs of life. We won't think, we will continue to think you didn't kill her if you tell us there were signs of life. And they repeatedly deny that this was a stillbirth and gloss over all the things that would make us all know that it was. Detective Fain says, I think I can speak for both of us I don't think you killed her, but I think you had signs that she was alive at least just a little bit. You know, but I don't think you killed her, but I believe that based on everything and talking to you, and I just believe that there were signs that she was alive at first. And then, but I don't think you tried to kill her, but I think there were signs that she was, and I want you to please for her. Just tell me what, tell us what those were. How do you know at first, you know, that she was probably alive just a little bit? You play the clip 119. We don't think, I think I can speak for both of us, I don't think you killed her, um, but I, I think you had signs that she was, was alive at least just a little bit, you know, but I don't think you killed her. But I believe that based on everything and talking to you, and, and I just believe that there are signs that she was alive um, at first, and then I don't think you tried to kill her. But I think there were signs that she was, and I want you to please for her. Just tell me what, tell us what those were. How did you know at first, you know, that she was probably alive just a little? So one of the words the prosecutor mentioned, gurgle, is like the fire. Children are predominantly obligate nose breathers. Unless their nose is completely congested, the first several months of life, they breathe through their nose, not their mouth. 
and it's a police word, gurgle. And if a child is delivered into water, they will not attempt to take a breath until they're put into the air. Some women actually choose to deliver underwater. It's called a mammalian dive reflex. So what do the police tell Skylar over and over again? In fact, I think they say this eight or nine times in the interrogation, gurgle. They say it a couple times before they finally break Skylar down. Guess what she says? Maybe a little gurgle. That's what he said, and that's what you'll hear. It's, it's their word gurgle. Gurgle, you create gurgle like with mouthwash blowing out of your mouth with air exhumed from your mouth. It is highly unlikely that a baby would gurgle out of their mouth. A newborn infant. Skyler was a young teenager who had no idea the medical significance. She had no idea what is so critical, and a lot of times the police didn't either, that the things that she said really did, she never used the word stillbirth ever in the interrogations. But what she did say is repeatedly, I never had to cut the cord. Never had to cut the cord. It's a lifeline for the baby. Most of us know that the cord, the umbilical cord, is attached to the placenta and it brings life to the fetus in the womb. <coughs> And at one, one point, even the detective is surprised that Skylar wouldn't have had to cut a, the cord for her baby. And you will see Skylar, again, searching, feeling guilty about this stillbirth. She thinks that the fact that she didn't cut the cord hurt the child. You'll see that in the interrogation. When the detective is surprised by the fact that she didn't have to cut the cord, Skylar says, oh my gosh. She has no idea what she's describing to these police officers. Lost over. Eyes closed, no heartbeat, not breathing. More than 29 times. But like the burning issue, they refuse to accept the truth. They want her to tell them their truth, even though their truth turned out later to be wrong. And in the interrogation, at one point, it was taken grossly out of context. Skylar's asked if she would have ever thought about an abortion, looked into an abortion, and she says directly to the detective, I did a Google search once, how not to have or how to get rid of a baby in the context of abortion or self-abortion. But what Skylar said after that is, I never did further research on it. I never went to a website. I never acted upon it. When the police ask for Skylar's phone, she freely gives it to them. They take her iPad, her computer, they take a Kindle. They take 20 electronics out of the Richardson household. They do a download. That search was not there. And what she told them was correct. There was not, no websites, no research, nothing about that statement that the prosecutor keeps bringing up and taken out of context. Now, they suggest that what Skylar, Skylar hit her pregnancy because she is evil, because she had this sinister, premeditated plan to kill a child. But what you're going to hear from, you're going to hear from some of Skylar's teachers, a counselor who saw Skylar every school day, an English teacher who saw her every school day, girls who worked with Skylar at Child Watch, who haven't seen her for two years, never hung out with her outside of work, but saw her interact with children. Skylar was a gentle, loving, kind individual who had problems, would not hurt an insect let alone being mean to a human being or a murderer. So this whole idea that nobody wants to know, no, Sky wants nobody to know, she goes back to the same OBGYN on July 12th. And there's a bunch of illusion here that, oh, she like, I can't see Dr. Andrew. The, the, you will hear from Dr. Andrew and Dr. Boyce that the way an OBGYN practice works typically, especially for a pregnant person, because you don't know what doctor's gonna be on call when you deliver, is you see different doctors see patients. She goes back to the same practice, and she knows she's gonna be asked. She, she knows that they know she's pregnant. And on April 26th, she could have refused the pregnancy test, and she did not. She goes back on July 12th, and Dr. Boyce ask, asks her, what happened to your child? And Skylar breaks down and sobs. 
And Dr. Boyce will tell you she described a stillborn. And Dr. Boyce put that in her notes. And Dr. Boyce said her reaction was genuine, sobbing, tears actually rolling down her cheeks. And people in outside of the exam room, outside of those, that, those walls of that room, heard Skylar sobbing, telling Dr. Boyce what happened. Now, Dr. Boyce and Dr. Andrew and a lot of other doctors in this case will talk about some that, that is indicative of a placental issue, placental abruption. IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction, drastically increases the odds of a stillbirth. And we can know that without being doctors, just looking at Skylar. There are people that look at those pictures of her on May 5th. There are people who knew her and saw her in person, didn't think she was pregnant. But the question should be, does she look nine months pregnant? Nine months pregnant. That's the question. Some people think she looks pregnant on May 5th. Some people don't. Some people actually saw her in person. Most people didn't. Six years of a serious eating disorder, anorexia and bulimia, highly indicative Chances are raised of stillbirth. And finally, as you've heard, no need to cut an umbilical cord. Skylar, you will hear, you will see in the interview, she had no idea what that meant. She was surprised about all of this conversation. The detective actually has to explain what a, what a placenta is to her. And the prosecutor showed you uh, bones, Annabelle's remains, which they dug up and put in plastic buckets. And they missed getting all of the remains when they were at Skylar's house the first time. And they go back and they find more in a shallow grave. They didn't even get all of Annabelle's remains. Why are we being shown all these photographs if the prosecutor's own doctor admits that there's no evidence, none, of trauma that would indicate that Skyler or anyone did anything to cause this child's death. Why? Why? <clears throat> Showing us her remains spread out, yeah, of course, she was buried in the ground in a marked grave, and they dug up her remains. Why are they parading these, marine, these remains in here? Why? Their own doctor. Their own doctor says no signs of trauma, none. So what's the importance of those? Thousands of text messages, tens of phones, tens of thousands of searches, text messages, Skylar didn't tell anyone that she had the stillborn. She kept it to herself. She did. And she put a smile on for the outside world and acted as if she was happy. She did. This case is about a rush to judgment. And it's all about that second interrogation. It's the whole case. And if you can't, if, if we know that the police were able to break her down and make her vulnerable and admit, to, and admit to something that is scientifically impossible, something that later is admitted to be wrong. They're going to base their entire case on the same, same interrogation. They didn't, when they found out this was all wrong, they didn't hit a reset button. They didn't say, we made a grave mistake when the doctor said I was wrong. In fact, apparently they were upset. They disregarded any truth, anything that would in any way question their truth and story. And they said, well, Skylar said it. We'll just keep going. We'll just keep moving forward. And I trust that you'll keep an open mind throughout this entire case. And at the end of this case, you'll find Skylar not guilty of all counts. Thank you.